Okay, thank you, Kim, and welcome everybody. My slides progressing here. Uh, welcome everybody, our uh, in-person members of our audience and also our Zoom members. Thank you for attending. And remember our first hybrid meeting last month had a few gitch glitches and uh, Kim rescued us. Thank you, Kim, for saving us. And uh, hopefully our uh, issues will be fine tonight. <laughs> so here's our agenda for the evening. Uh, some announcements, then we'll have our speaker, Jennifer, talking about the historic newspaper collections in and around our region. Then I'll take the uh, PowerPoint back and do the upcoming meetings and the chat if there's time. So the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation was this past Friday, September 30th. And in that spirit, the Durham Region Branch of Ontario Ancestors acknowledges the lands and peoples of the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation, the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation, and a large Métis community. We recognize the lands on which we gather are covered under the Williams Treaties and rest within the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the Anishinaabe Nation, which also includes Algonquin, Chippewa, Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi. We honor and recognize the, and respect these nations and indigenous people as the traditional stewards of the lands and the waters on which we meet. And I'm going to start off with a little bit of society business. Uh, Sheila, do you want to give uh, the treasurer's report? Yes, thank you, Nancy. Hello, everyone. Um, like last month, as Nancy said, there, <laughs> there were glitches, but um, I'll just go to the end uh, of the summer. And our balance at that time was $1,776.26. During the month of September, we had our um, rent and internet from uh, the church, uh, speaker um, payment, and our service charge. And that was a total of $453, leaving us with, actually there was, and there was no deposits. So the balance is $1,323 and 26 cents. Um, that was the end of the month, September 29th, and the balance is the same as of today. Thank you, Sheila. You're welcome. And I'm going to take this uh, minute to uh, give notice of our annual general meeting, and it will be for the purposes of receiving reports and recognizing our volunteers. So who wants to get on board with us? Uh, we're a wonderful crew. Come and join us. Uh, since a lot of team, our team members are willing to stay on, I am asking for about four more volunteers to uh, consider submitting their names to us. Uh, you can talk to me or email me at the uh, email address on the screen and mark it as volunteers and that will be sent to either Stephen Wood, uh, the past chair, or myself. And there are a lot of opportunities to help the branch, both from people living near and those from a distance. So don't think that you're not eligible. Not only are we recognizing volunteers, we are also celebrating our 40th anniversary. Our branch was formed in 1982. We plan on recognizing volunteers and also eating cake. So if you live in the area, please plan on coming out to the meeting in person. And those at the distance, well, you'll be able to see the cake. Unfortunately, we can't <laughs> send it over the internet. The next OGS webinar is going to be this coming Thursday. Uh, it's about death records by Diane Richard. Uh, there are over 20 different places where we might find documentation of death. So that sounds well worth uh, attending. 
Uh, you can uh, register for it on the OTS main website and it starts at 7 p.m. On the local level, the Lakeshore Genealogical Society, which is based in Cooper, is holding an in-person meeting as well as Zoom on October 17th, that's the Monday. Uh, it's going to be in the Rotary Room and the doors open at 6.15, or 6.30. .15, and the actual meeting, I believe, starts about seven. The speaker is me. And it will be a repeat of our Exploring Ancestry DNA website. And for more information, you need to send an email to lgsregister at gmail.com, which is right here. Also in local news, the uh, Oshawa Historical Society has Dr. Amy Barron coming on, on Tuesday, October 17th. Uh, it is about uh, archaeologists. What do they do during wartime? Well, they often become spies, and the most famous one was Lawrence of Arabia. So that should be an interesting talk. Admission is $3, or free if you're a member of the Oshawa Historical Society. And on the international front, Roots Tech is coming back in 2023, and it's going to be in-person and virtual. Um, so last year, they, I forget how many millions of people attended, but plan to join millions of virtual and in-person attendees on March 2nd to 4th, 2023. I looked at the rootstech.org website to get updates and there's a spot where you can sign up for a newsletter from them and then you'll be informed when the registration actually opens. And coming soon, we're just about to publish, we're in the just in the proofreading stage, Small Cemeteries of Pickering Township. Uh, so it uh, will be up in the marketplace fairly soon. Another item that just came tonight is we have several more um, high school yearbooks being added to our collection. We just received the donation of three tonight. And that's, it, that's called the Phoenix. Where's it from? Central Collegiate in Oshawa. Central Collegiate in Oshawa. So we've got three more books from them. So at this point, um, we're up for our main presentation. I'm just gonna introduce Jennifer and then I'll turn it over to her. So Jennifer has been with the Oshawa Historical Society for 23 years. 22 of those years spent as the archivist. This role has given Jennifer the opportunity to put to good use for undergraduate work in history and cultural anthropology while also putting into practice the theories and skills learned while earning her master's degree in museum studies. In this position, Jennifer has not only devoted time to digitizing and reorganizing the archival collection, while still maintaining the day-to-day -day collections management work, but she has also been focused on filling in gaps in the archival collection through focused collecting practices and original research. She has had the pleasure of sharing her work through presenting at conferences, developing and leading workshops for local students, and speaking to various community groups. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and let Jennifer bring up hers. Good evening, everyone. Within the world of historical research, newspapers are a fascinating source of both primary and secondary information. They can provide the researcher with vital statistics information or with context to better understand the social norms of the time. As part of our mandate to preserve Oshawa's history, the Oshawa Museum maintains a large collection of hard copy and microfilm newspapers within the archival collection. Okay, so a little bit about the Oshawa Museum. The Oshawa Museum started in 1957, and for over 60 years, we've collected, shared the history of Oshawa, 
from the earliest indigenous inhabitants to present day. Oshawa is located about 50 kilometers east of Toronto and our museum is in Oshawa's Lakeview Park on the shores of Lake Ontario. The Oshawa Museum is comprised of three restored Victorian homes, all of which are still standing on their original foundations. Our fourth building is our drive shed where we house our carriage collection and various agricultural artifacts. We are the only community museum in Oshawa we are home to 50,000 objects and photographs covering social history, science, technology, and Indigenous history. Our collection is diverse, just like Oshawa's history, and we are committed to expanding the narratives that we share. Now, when we're looking at the history of newspapers, according to the Canadian Encyclopedia, the first newspapers in what is now known as Canada were published in Nova Scotia and Quebec in the early 1750s, followed by Upper Canada in the 1790s. At the time, these were known as gazettes, and they were instruments of the colonial government that were tightly controlled and monitored by government officials who subsidized the papers. It wasn't until 1800 to around 1850 that independent newspapers were first established. During that time, printing presses became less expensive to establish and to operate, and literacy rates began to rise, and there was an appetite for news and views. Most colonial newspapers in North America were directly connected to commercial printing operations that depended on government subsidies to, to operate. Known as, quote, King's Printers, they were independent businesses that received most of their income from printing materials for colonial officials, such as proclamations, laws, and regulations. The first printers to set up shop in Halifax were the uh, first printers set up shop in Halifax, Quebec City, and Montreal in the 1750s, and published weekly newspapers known as gazettes. These newspapers did in fact disseminate official notices on behalf of the colonial administrators. Their reliance on revenues from sources other than readers, by that we mean governments, political parties and advertisers, was characteristic of Canadian newspapers until the 1850s when colonial populations and commerce expanded and reader and advertising revenues became much more profitable. In Canada, the Halifax Gazette was the first newspaper published in what is now Canada. Its first edition was a two-page paper, and it was printed on the 23rd of March, 1750. Now, in our area, according to amateur historian Samuel Pedler, there have been newspapers in our community since around the 1840s. In his unpublished manuscript, he claimed that the earliest paper in our community was the Luminary, a Christian paper which started in 1844. Following it was a paper called the Literary Newsletter, which started around 1848 and was published by Oliphant and White. A name change to the Oshawa Reformer took place in 1850. According to Pedler, quote, its motto, cheap government and trustworthy officials, would indicate its purpose. It is unknown when both of these papers ceased publishing. The 1877 County of Ontario Atlas made note of the Tribune and the Friendly Moralist to other papers that were to, be, to have been printed in Oshawa. Around 1851, a new paper came on the scene with the Ontario Freeman, or sorry, the Oshawa Freeman, and shareholders in this paper included some rather well-known names, Dr. William McGill, Abram Farewell, and Thomas N. Gibbs. It appears most of these papers were short-lived, but the next paper to establish itself in our community was around for decades. It's unknown exactly when it started, as many sources give a different year, but it is safe to say that by the mid 1850s, James E. McMillan and James Luke purchased interest in the Oshawa Freeman 
McMillan's interests were purchased then by a WH Orr, and a new enterprise began called the Oshawa Vindicator. The Vindicator operated with a conservative slant and supported conservative candidates and politics. In 1866, Orr was bought out by a gentleman by the name of John S. Lark, and the paper then had a number of different owners from the years on end until it ceased publishing in 1917. Offering the opposing liberal viewpoint for Oshawa readers was the Ontario Reformer. Under the direction of a Mr. Climey of Bowmanville, the first issue was published in 1871. For a short time, Luke and Lark operated both the Reformer and the Vindicator, until Mr. Mundy purchased the Reformer in the late 1870s. The Reformer went through a number of name changes through the years, most notably when they became the Oshawa Daily Times in 1927. An amalgamation with the Whitby Gazette and Chronicle in 1942 resulted in the name change to the Oshawa Times Gazette. And a number of years later, that name was shortened to simply the, the Oshawa Times. In 1994, a labor strike imp impacted the paper. And this, in conjunction with paper operating at a deficit for a number of years, led to its closure in 1994. Oshawa's historic newspaper collection can be accessed both online and in person and are held by both the Oshawa Museum and the McLaughlin branch of the Oshawa Public Library. Oshawa's newspapers themselves have a story and one that impacts research in a relatively negative manner. Like most early newspaper collections throughout the province, the newspapers were originally preserved by being microfilmed. Both the library and the archives at the museum have microfilm readers accessible for researchers. Microfilm is a good way to preserve the rather fragile medium that are newspapers and can be now a very easy way to digitize and upload online. Unfortunately, when accessing the microfilms of Oshawa's early newspapers, a problem becomes immediately noticeable. There are gaps in the collection and in the newspaper record. The microfilm newspaper collection goes from 1862 to 1872, and those are a rather complete collection. Then it jumps to 1922. The early 1920s are hit and miss, the period between 1926 and 1929 is fairly complete, but then there is another gap from 1932 until 1946. After this, the newspaper collection is rather substantial and complete. You will note that there's some gaps over some rather major world events. This rather substantial gap is due to the fact that the hard copy papers were lost in a fire prior to being microfilmed. Due to a fire at the Oshawa Times in 1971, the earliest archives of the Oshawa Vindicator were lost. All was not lost, thankfully, as we do have the um, issues from the 1860s, but it is a tremendous loss of Oshawa's history and truly impacts those who are trying to research those time periods. Like I mentioned, we are missing World War I, World War II, and the Depression. <laughs> which makes researching those times challenging. However, since its creation in 1957, the Oshawa Historical Society, the organization that manages the Oshawa Museum, has been collecting hard copy newspapers to fill in that substantial gap. In 2015, the Oshawa Museum received a Documentary Heritage Communities Program Grant, or a DHCP, from Library and Archives Canada. This grant allowed us to photograph hard copy newspapers, digitize the microfilm reels, and make available online the earliest of Oshawa's papers up until 1930. Now, there are two ways to digitize hard copy newspapers. The first way was to have them scanned. While we can scan many items in our collections in-house, it's challenging to, scar to scan large-scale items such as newspapers as we do not have the technology to handle items of that size. 
If we were to scan them in-house, we would have had to scan the paper in several sections and then digitally stitch together the images. As you can imagine, this is rather labor intensive and time consuming with the potential to lose information if the images are not properly stitched together. Now, there are companies that have large scale scanners and we have utilized them in the past, but it was determined that many of these newspapers were too fragile to transport offsite and put through a scanner. Large documents such as newspapers can also be digitized by photographing them. This method means that the image of the entire document can be captured at one time and means that the potential to lose information is far less. It's also less time consuming. The decision was made to hire an outside photographer using funds from the grant to come on site and photograph the collection. The images were taken at an incredibly high resolution for preservation purposes with a secondary file at lower resolution created for the purposes of sharing online. With the hard copies of the newspapers photographed and saved as digital files, we then turned to digitizing the microfilmed copies of the collection. The decision was, ba was made, unfortunately based on cost, to digitize only the earliest available microfilm and stop at 1930. This part of the project was completed by an outside company that held the master copies of the newspaper microfilm. We actually found out who that company was after we ourselves had suffered a fire in uh, December 17, 2003. Originally, the plan had been to work with the library to host the digitized newspapers on our Digital World platform. That plan had to change due to the cost being prohibitive. And so the Oshawa Museum worked with Data uh, Repro com Company to have the collection hosted on the Canadian Community Digital Archives. This was due to funding concerns and the simple fact that we could not afford to host the collection on our digital world. The agreement with Data Reprocom meant that we were able to digitize the microfilm, which they held the master copy of, upload the digital, digitized photographs of the hard copy collection, and host the entire collection online at a cost more in line with the abilities of the museum. The decision to digitize from 1862 to 1930 was based on a couple of factors. The first factor, unfortunately, was cost. Originally, the plan had been to digitize the hard copy and microfilm newspapers to up to 1950. That had to change when it was determined that we could not afford that and decided that uh, digitizing up to 1930 was achievable within the budget approved through the grant along with the yearly cost of having the collection hosted online. The decision also took into account potential issues around copyright. It was safer to err on the side of caution when determining which papers to make available online. When researching Oshawa's history, the Oshawa Public Library has a fantastic source in their digitized Oshawa Worker collection. This is a newspaper published bi-monthly by the local 222 of the United Automobile, Aircraft and Agricultural Implement Workers of America. The newspaper provides a wealth of information regarding work of the UAW, but also members of the organization. It provides a glimpse into the lives of the employees, both at work and outside of work. The history of Oshawa is closely connected to the history of the surrounding communities in what is now Durham region be it families moving between the communities, businesses opening sites in more than one location, or the railway allowing for easier movements of goods, services, and people, the history of Oshawa is closely connected to the history of the surrounding communities. It's helpful when you encounter a gap in a collection as important, uh, as important to research as newspapers are, to take the time to see what information may have been printed in the newspapers of surrounding communities. Both the Whitby and Bowmanville newspapers often printed articles about happenings in Oshawa and have been helpful at providing context for events during those years that our newspapers no longer exist. Like the majority of our early newspaper collections, the Whitby collection was digitized from the microfilmed versions. This means that the digital copy is truly only as good as the microfilmed copy. In some cases with the Oshawa newspapers, this means that the pages are not as clear as one would like and 
There are times when the type has bled through the bottom page and makes it challenging to read. The Bowmanville newspapers, however, were digitized from a hard copy collection. This means that the digitized copy is only as good as the original copy. That being said, they tend to be more clear and have less bleed through. The earliest Whitby paper available online is the Whitby Chronicle, of which issues dating from 1857 to 1912 exist. Much like Oshawa, Whitby had an opposing paper printed alongside the Chronicle. The Whitby Gazette has also been digitized and is available from 1862 to 1912. The Whitby Chronicle newspaper was started by a William Henry Higgins in around 1856-1857. The office was located at 173 Brock Street North and was constructed by a John Ham Perry. The Whitby Chronicle was a newspaper that contained the news of Ontario County. Higgins published the Whitby Chronicle until March 29, 1883, when he sold the business to a James S. Robertson. In 1912, Charles A. Goodfellow combined the Whitby Gazette with the Whitby Chronicle to form the Gazette and Chronicle. In January 1942, the Gazette and Chronicle combined with the Oshawa Daily Times to become the Times Gazette, and later the Oshawa Times. The Oshawa Times ceased publication on November 5, 1994. The Canadian Statesman, uh, the newspaper from Bowmanville, was first published in 1837. The paper was founded by Reverend John M. Kleine, but it passed through several different owners before being purchased by Moses Aaron James on August 1st, 1878. The paper remained published by the James family for over 100 years. The James family is a well-known name in publishing in Bowmanville and continue to have a presence in the community with the James Printing and Signs Company. While the first paper was published in 1837, the earliest copy available is from January 2nd, 1868. The paper reported on the happenings of not only Bowmanville, but the surrounding townships of Clark and Darlington. In, in, I'm sorry, in 1895, the paper experienced a serious fire. Even with this fire, the Clarington Public Library, Museums and Archives was able to develop a collection that does not have any really large gaps. The Canadian Statesman had competition in the name of the Merchant and General Advertiser. This paper was begun in 1869 by a Reverend C. Barker and was published between 1869 and 1874. The paper circulated widely in townships around Bowmanville and contains a great deal of information on the development of the smaller communities. In the final issue, the Merchant and General Advertiser on September 15, 1876, the editor noted, quote, our last arrangements have been entered into by which the merchant will be incorporated with the statesman. Arrangements have been made for improving the statesman in both matter and appearance. And the determination is to make the paper worthy of the confidence and support of every reformer in the riding Next week, the statesman may be expected to make its departure. And so the newspapers amalgamated into one. The Clarington Museum, Museums and Archives, in partnership with the Clarington Public Library, today known as the Clarington Public Library, Museums and Archives, digitized the collections that they held for not only Bowmanville, but also the surrounding communities that are now part of Clarington. Clarington itself was formed by the amalgamation of the former town of Bowmanville, the village of Newcastle, and the townships of Clark and Darlington. In 1993, the municipality was renamed Clarington, a blend of the names of the original townships of Clark and Darlington. Included in the digitization project were newspapers from Newcastle, as well as the Orno Weekly Times. The Newcastle Village and District Historical Society does maintain some rare newspapers in their collection. As of now, those are only available for researchers to view in hard copy. The organization is working towards digitizing the papers, but it is expensive and it is slow going. Pickering was ahead of the curve when it came to making access to their local history and archival collection online. In the 1990s, the Pickering Library began to compile a local history database that would make available documents from the collection 
along with historic newspapers, PADA, or Pickering Ajax Digital Archives, provided early online access to the newspapers from both communities. The earliest newspapers available online for Pickering are the Pickering News. Papers start in late 1881 and go until 1964. Pickering News was then replaced by the Pickering Post. Also available are digital copies of the Pickering Post from 1964 to 1995, the Bay Weekly Porter, Reporter for only 1967, the Bay News from 1985 until 1997, and the News Advisor Pickering Edition from 1991 to 2011. The Lake Scugog Historical Society has digitized and made available online newspapers related to Port Perry and area. The earliest paper in the Ontario is the Ontario is the Ontario Observer, dated December 12, 1957. The paper focused on news, events, and people from the northern portion of Ontario County. The Observer's competing newspaper was the Port Perry Standard. The earliest standard available dates are August 16, 1866. Much like other communities, the competing newspapers provided stories from either a small L liberal perspective or a small C conservative point of view. The Ontario Observer is available from or sorry, 1857 until 1883 when it became the North Ontario Observer. The Port Perry Standard is available from 1866 to 1897. These papers offer a slightly different perspective of what development of not what the now Durham region looks like and that their articles focus more on concerns of that northern section of Ontario County. Now, much like the people and businesses move between communities in what is now Durham region, connections were often made with communities east of the region. And much like Durham region, collections related to the various municipalities found within Northumberland County are held in a variety of sites and in a variety of formats. Municipalities within Northumberland seem to have their own collections of their local newspapers and handle them each a little differently. For example, Coburg newspapers from 1848 until current are only available on microfilm on the second floor of the Coburg Public Library. The library does maintain a newspaper index online at the Coburg Public Library site with Our Digital World. Crammy newspapers for Colburn and Castleton have been digitized by Heritage Crammy and are available through, uh, through the Crammy Township Public Library's presence on our digital world. The Campbellford and Seymour Heritage Center have Trent Hills newspapers and they have a massive index program, project, but they only index uh, major events and weddings, funerals, et cetera. Whereas the Coburg newspapers uh, are indexed as well from 1848 until 1911, but they cover uh, social things such as clubs, sports, families, and schools. The Northumberland County Archives and Museums maintains a Sun Media collection, all the negatives and contact sheets from the local papers from 1987 until 1997. They are not yet available online, but they can be viewed on site. Port Hope's collection are in Port Hope. Port Hope itself has the distinction of holding the oldest newspaper in the area that I have come across. The Port Hope Telegraph from July 10th, 1832 has been digitized and is available online for researchers. Even if your relatives weren't in the Port Hope area at the time, it's a really interesting look at an early time period of the area. The paper provides researchers with articles about topics that can easily help inform about the development of their own community. For example, there is an article on lands for sale in Upper Canada. The article goes into a short history of how land was surveyed and divided up within the colony when it was first established. The article is not Port Hope specific. In fact, it's not even Northumberland County specific, but it goes into how the lands in much of the southern portion of Upper Canada were divided. This is helpful for a variety of researchers and can add context to those looking to better understand why our communities look as they do today. From a social history perspective, the two stories above are fascinating when researching women's history. Again, while these articles may be more specific to Port Hope, 
they can help inform what life was like in the communities that we may be researching. And it's just really interesting to have something that dates back to 1832. While the 1832 Telegraph is the earliest paper, the Port Hope Watchman is the earliest available series of newspapers. Available online are 21 newspapers, the majority of which are from 1851. These newspapers report on the happenings in Port Hope as well as Durham and Northumberland counties. The Port Hope Public Library maintains a microfilm collection of the newspapers. Within their collection are numerous newspapers which have been microfilmed, but not yet digitized. The originals of those microfilm newspapers are held at the Archive of Ontario. This is just a sample of newspaper resources available to assist researchers and is by no means a comprehensive list of resources available within Durham region and the surrounding area. While numerous sites are working hard to digitize their collections and provide online access, this is time consuming and costly. Smaller sites may find it outside of their capabilities. And this means that researchers will continue to find it necessary to visit sites in person in order to access sources that may assist with their projects. Thank you. We do questions? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Jennifer. Jennifer. <laughs> Be saying thank you to Kim a lot. Um, thank you, Jennifer. That was very comprehensive and um, really helpful to anybody researching in the old Durham, old Durham County, old Northumberland County, mm -hmm. and old Ontario County. So I only have one question at this point, and that's from Donna, and she asks. Which historical newspaper would most likely have news from Brooklyn, which is just north of Whitby? Yeah, um, I would check with what they have in the Whitby collection. Um, they do have hard, a variety of Brooklyn newspapers that are available on their Our Digital World site. So certainly check through the Whitby Public Library. And I have the link here, um, and it's in the handout. So you can check out the uh, Whitby Public Library's Our Digital World collection. They have more than just the Whitby Chronicle and the Whitby Gazette. They have a wide variety of newspapers related to what is now communities that are now part of the Whitby uh, town of Whitby proper. Yep. Um, so, Bob Bell here, and you're going to have to come up and speak loudly. I can. I can repeat his question. Yeah. Yes. She told me not to speak too loud because I would be picked up. That's <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, when I was talking. Uh, any your handout uh, for people that are physically here? At the back of the room. Uh huh. Okay. The or next. If you want digital, I can send it to you. Send it to me. Okay. And I'll grab one as well. But, uh, second question: a Number of years ago, the branch here um, arranged to uh, copy some of the Bowmanville Statesman. Um, where where did they go and what year did we go to and did anybody ever finish it? Uh, it was, I can answer some of that or Anne can. Um, I can't remember the years. Uh, I believe we started, I believe we started after uh, the ones that had already been done, so perhaps 1929 or something like that. Um, but the, all the, the microfilms that were done are in our collection upstairs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and the also, the Bowmanville Library has them, and I think a couple of other local libraries have copies as well. But but um, we stopped doing that when Clarington started doing the comprehensive, and they they did all of, all of the rest. Oh, okay. I was just quite curious whether it was done. Yeah. Um, okay, <laughs> and they redid the old ones too. Oh, did they? they, they did the ones around microfilm, mm -hmm. they redid them in better resolution digitally. Yeah, they were lucky enough in that they had hard copies, I think, for the vast majority of their newspaper collection. And so they were able to, like, when you check out the difference between, like, the Oshawa newspapers or the Whippy ones that were digitized from the microfilm, and then you look at the ones that were digitized from the hard copy, hard copy is preferable, right? Um, but the reality is, is maintaining a hard copy collection is... It takes up a lot of space. Um, you need to make sure that you have proper um, humidity controls because newsprint is not designed to last forever, right? It is literally designed to, <laughs> to not last. It, it's, it's a very acidic paper. So 
Um, we're happy that we even have any Oshawa papers. And like I said, the microfilm, what you see online is what you saw on the microfilm. So in some cases, the newspaper was folded over when they microfilmed it. So you're missing chunks. Sometimes somebody had taken the time to cut out an article or a photograph. So those are gone. But and I'm a big fan of beggars can't be choosers. And we're really happy to have what we do have. Another question. Mm -hmm. um, what's the time degradation for the various media we've copied into and are they taking precautions about that because the earliest microfilm now will be getting a number of years old and especially maybe a popular year that has a fair amount of wear and the same with the digital what, what precautions do, are, are you taking well for us in particular we are no longer mi microfilming anything uh we're going straight to full digitization so uh, microfilming is still fabulous, and there is companies that have the master copies, which are higher resolution microfilm than than the copies that you'll find on heavy rotation within um, uh, within public libraries or at that like us at the museum. Uh, when we had our fire in two thousand and three, that's when we had to approach this company and say, "You have <laughs> the master copies. We'd like to purchase." Um, Preston owns the microfilms for the census records and for a section of the early newspapers. And then the data repro company owns the, the more recent Preston ones. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what's happened to the Toronto Star, uh, yeah. well, yeah. the Toronto Star uh, archives. It used to be able to use to be able to pay money and read those old papers. You can do that. You have access through to the Toronto Star archive through the Whitby Public Library. So you can access the Toronto Star Archive through there. And then the Oshawa Public Library can provide access to the Globe and Mail Archive. So they're still available. Um, but again, we want to talk cost prohibitive, right? So once upon a time, the public, Oshawa Public Library had access to all of them. But they, because of the cost, made a decision, my understanding is to just host Toronto one and then Whippy's hosting the other. Toronto Reference Library even has a telegram. Yeah, and that's nice. I have a question about digitizing. Mm -hmm. I saw the picture of the photographer um, set up with his camera. Mm -hmm. I think I could duplicate that with my <laughs> tripod. Mm -hmm. And I think we have some of those big lights someone used to do silk screening to shine at 45 degrees at both angles. But I don't know how uh, it would, like, I see the tape on the floor, but you're not taping the newspaper, nope. what are you doing there? Laying a clear sheet over top of the newspaper? Yes, yeah. Um, so there is, on the bottom, you see a grid, right? And then we put on top of it a very clear uh, sheet of plastic to ensure that it is okay. We had to turn off all the lights in the boardroom. We did it in-house because, again, like when you have newspapers that are fragile and incredibly rare, I didn't want to risk sending them out. Um I, I'm, I'm very protective of those newspapers, particularly the ones that do not exist in any other format. Like, I think I have two papers from 1918, two, four from 1916. Like, these are, are very precious. So we wanted to do them in-house because I wanted, to, I wanted to be all up in his case the whole time, basically, making sure that everything was done um, to a high level of standard and safe. So we had um, Alex there along with, oh, and I can't remember his name, shoot. Um, so Alex is um, in the black t-shirt. He was the one who was working, a, our staff member who was on the whole time. Mm -hmm. He was hired under the grant and worked to uh, make sure that everything was okay. We went through and prepared all the newspapers beforehand. So if there was any that were dirty, we made sure to clean them. If they had any tears that would impact um, the photographing process, we would repair them um, just so that we had the best possible copy to work from. I was taught how to do that by Lauren Preston. Yeah. When we took the statesman into his business, uh, I had the job of preparing the, the sheets and you know, trying to make them presentable for the photographer. And uh, Bob and I are joint owners of a bunch of statesmen's uh, <laughs> box of them that we got <laughs> at the flea market. The flea market. <laughs> And I, I've been holding off digitizing because even though I have a large format flatbed scanner, it's not big enough and I'd have to do all that stitching stuff with Microsoft, uh, no, what do you call it? Uh, ICE, um, 
Well, the Microsoft gives a, a free stitcher. Mm -hmm. Image Composite Editor, they call it. ICE. And it's the best one I've seen, but I don't, I didn't want to. It, I've done it with other newspapers, but those newspapers, the sheets are so big, those old ones. It's just difficult. Okay. I got a bunch of questions flowing in. Okay, yeah. Let's go back to our Zoom audience. So Bob and Barb are asking, is there any work by other organizations to get their papers digitized that you're aware of? All of the organizations that I know of are working to get more and more of them available. Currently, the Oshawa Public Library has taken where we stopped at 1930 and is carrying on uh, digitizing the microfilm for Oshawa to uh, a more recent. I'm not sure what their, their cutoff is that they're looking at. But Bowmanville's are, are done. I think they literally have all of their archival newspapers digitized. So go them. Except um, for the holes so that fire you're talking yep. about. And I've seen a lot of the, when I was preparing them, a lot of cutouts. Yeah. When people yeah. came in, they were, had free access to the room where they were kept. I know the... Um, like Scugog Historical Society is continuing to work to get their copies for the Port Perry newspapers digitized. Um, in terms of Northumberland, I know Port Hope is still working. So yeah, everyone is, is doing the very best we can to get as much as we can available online. Because let's face it, everyone likes to surf, do our research at home if at all possible. Okay. Uh, Douglas would like you to put up your last screen of sources again. Yep. Now, are they all, they're all in the handout. They are. So these, I only listed the local sources in my presentation, but on my handout are also more national sources. And those actually came from the work of Cher Latouse, who is uh, with the Newcastle Village and District Historical Society. So these are just some local ones. Do you know uh, if there are any issues of the Port Hope Evening Guide? online oh that is a good question and let's go back to the port hope let's see well there's the guide i would suggest that that's probably it so yeah if they go to this website there's a ton of different newspapers um for port hope that are available so yeah i assume the evening guide is the guide so yeah, yeah. and then there's a weekly guide and a yeah 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 Okay. So there's at least some of them are available online. I don't know how many. Okay, uh, Bob is asking, you mentioned that newspapers could be found on our digital world. In the past, I have found Bowmanville and Newcastle papers on our Ontario. Is it still operating? Our Ontario and our digital world are the same thing. Okay. Uh, our Ontario was the former name of it, and then it became uh, our digital world. So okay. yes, it's still... So I have put the um, digital uh, handout several times in the chat. So don't forget to go there and download it. I have a report here from Grant. Uxbridge Library has an extensive collection of the Uxbridge Times, Uxbridge Times Journal, and Uxbridge Cosmos. The Uxbridge Journal is indexed 1869 to 1910 and a mix of years to 1997. The Cosmos and Standard have much of the years from 2000 to date indexed. Uh, none of the papers are digitized, but are on microfilm and index is on, indexing is ongoing. And, and Grant is the chair of the Uxbridge Genealogy Group. Uh, so it's under their auspices that they're doing a lot of the indexing. If they are interested in digitization, my understanding is the Documentary Heritage Communities Program grant through Library and Archives Canada is still available. Uh, that was the only way we could afford to undertake that project. Now, it's a big grant application, but it was truly well worth it um, to have that act that uh, to be able to digitize and make accessible the newspapers. Well, there's someone up in Sunderland who knows how to write grants really well. <laughs> like I said, it's a lot of work. It's one of those grants that is big, but certainly well worth it. But he, he, he'd be worth uh, working on it for mm -hmm. We had over 60 people online. It's dropped a bit now. Yeah, I had 68. We wrote it yeah. down. Uh, would you know if the Toronto Telegram is available anywhere? Online? Um, 
Okay, as of uh, several years ago, I don't know, like, my information's not quite up to date, but it was only on microfilm and it was at the Toronto Reference Library and it hadn't been digitized. Okay, or Toronto or Reference index, or indexed. But, <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> Toronto <laughs> Reference Library uh, had the microfilm. And you could stick a USB key in there and make a copy of the page. Okay, take them all yeah. Down. And that the uh, readers had the ability to put in a USB key, not indexed and not online. Yep, yep. Several years ago. Yes. So, so maybe working on it, I don't know. Yes. I haven't come across it um, online as of yet. Uh, but again, it's possible that behind the scenes they are working to get that available. When I was you trying to use the Toronto Telegraph, what I did was I went to one of the other newspapers that was indexed found the dates when the like, thing I wanted to know about happened, and then I went and looked at the telegram on those dates to see what they said. Well, it's the same idea as us when we're researching Oshawa history, right? We're like, well, I know something happened here, but I don't have the newspapers. We're going to see if Whitby or maybe Bowmanville wrote about it. They're handy. They do. Well, I was reading the uh, Bowmanville one today, 1976, October the 27th. And they had an article about the uh, councillors for Peterborough County taking a jaunt in a bus at public expense to take the wives to Toronto for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nothing is sacred. <laughs> uh, Deb wants to know how do you clean a newspaper? No, good question. Uh, and I've had a lot of experience because, again, because of those huge gaps, um, if somebody brings in a newspaper that I don't have and fits in that gap, I take it. No matter how filthy it is, no matter if it's one page, if there's cuts out of it, I will take it. So what we have is you'll use like a, a very a soft paintbrush and you can gently dust off any surface dirt. Um, if it's still really dirty, we have these sponges that we use. And again, it's almost, there's, they're filled with basically little broken up erasers and you gently just kind of move it over to remove surface. You don't want to go too hard because, again, newsprint is not designed to last and you can remove the ink and that would be terrible and counterproductive. So, yeah, like I said, start off with a really soft um, paintbrush and just kind of jet unused paintbrush. Uh, should go without saying, but unused paintbrush and, and gently just kind of brush off surface dirt. Okay. And I was taught for wrinkles. Use a damp sponge to take the wrinkle out. That's Very nice. carefully. Cool, yeah. yeah. No yeah. pressure one. <laughs> no. Well, I remember Anne talking about ironing these newspapers that you were getting digitized or yeah. microfilm many years ago. Yes, okay. she did. Yeah. Um, okay. Which paper would carry news from the small villages of Claremont, Altona, and Mongolia? Well, I would think Pickering and or Uxbridge. I know Pickering does carry, a, has information on a wide area. So yeah, I would certainly check with the Pickering papers. They don't have as many online as you would hope, um, but they are, the, the ones that they do have are early and helpful and do talk about kind of those surrounding areas. In Mongolia, um, I, I know that um, there, were, there was information uh, in the Economist and Sun about the area around where Mongolia is, and that's the market paper. Okay, oh, there you go. Yeah, like I said, always look at surrounding new, uh, communities because yeah. there's, you know, you're bound to find at least one or two items that well, can help. The Mongolia kids went to my high school, Martin High School, so just, there okay. you go, so mark them. <laughs> Mongolia must be very close to the line between <laughs> Markham and Uxbridge. Okay, the statesman is searchable. Does digitizing make the papers searchable? Not automatically. Um, you have to OCR them, which is a fancy term for optical character recognition. And it is. And, so. Yeah. And um, the vast majority of us, when we put our newspapers up, do OCR them. So we do put them through a, a thing to make it uh, searchable. That being said, OCR is only as good as its ability to pick up the characters. So sometimes it's phenomenal, particularly if the typeface that the newspaper is used is nice and crisp and clear. But if it's not, then you may just be sitting there going through page by page. 
which if you're like me, is not a bad thing. Like I call it going down the rabbit hole. Like you can lose days in a newspaper. You look up and go, holy cow, it's nighttime. So yeah, you do have to put it through a program called optical character recognition. And we do that for anything that we put digitally online. Just a tip, I digitized a book for somebody recently. And I tried to put any software and every software and technique um, using my cell phone and Google. Did it just incredibly great, great. Cell phone and Google. Yeah. yeah. What was the step you used? And you went to docs and uh... yeah, no, just I had the book. I used two lamps. I found illumination made a big difference. I had it on a table, and I just took my cell phone and clicked. The pictures appeared, and it goes into Google Photos, and there's a little thing you click on, say, change it into text, you copy and paste it. Hmm. And I did a, like a 200-page book for somebody. Wow. And like I tried everything, and I was uh, it, very painful, a lot of corrections. This book was a one-off book. It wasn't terribly old, but it was a one-off. Uh, the person said I could destroy it if I had to, but preferably I didn't. They call it guillotining, so you get the individual sheets. Or yeah. yeah. So uh, it was a paperback. So it, it tended to go like that. And so I tried to hold it the best I could. And like with yeah. two, two or three people, it might have been better holding it down. But I just held it the best I could. And even though it wasn't perfectly flat, uh, I just took a quick look at each one and sometimes there'd be a little bit of correction I've been, I've been using how much I've been using Abby A B B Y. Seems to be pretty good, but try to try to try, try what you did. Yeah. It, it was an incredible like when I hit it, it was wow. When we digitize items that we make available on our websites, I use a program called Nitro Pro. And it um, it has a, a section where you can OCR it. So I will spell check and then OCR it, even if it's just like I've scanned a, a paper and I'm doing it, I still spell check just so that it, the two of them work in conjunction. Um, so yeah, they don't just automatically, digitizing and uploading does not automatically make something searchable. You have to make sure that you OCR it first. Okay, um, Bob is asking, might some organization think of publishing a listing of links in one place to where various newspapers can be found? Um, there are two sources I've seen like that. One is Can Genealogy by Dave Obi out in BC. He has a lot of newspaper links there. Um, and he also does, he on his site has, on his site has indexed the names of the papers in the Google newspaper archive by geography. So if you get a paper called the Telegraph, it you know he's got an index, so you know it's from Toronto, that sort of thing. Um, and there's another one, and I can't think of the name of it. You're not talking about Cindy's list. No, not Cindy's list. Although that might be a good spot to check too. Um, the ancestor hunt. Might I? It could be. I'm not sure. Um, I've got a note here from Nick. The Telegram. It's not available still. A uh, large portion of Microfilm Toronto Reference Library is off limits at present, as it's experiencing vinegar syndrome. Oh no! That's the worst thing you can have happen. And I don't know who holds the master copies of those. Well, what's the syndrome? Uh, it's, de it's degrading. Um, when you go in and you smell vinegar, it's never a good thing <laughs> within an archive. And that means it's degrading and at a rel relatively quick Fast speed. Rate. Yeah. So that's not ideal. So Joanne said, years ago, I looked through the telegram photos at York University. A good talk tonight, she says. Oh, thank you. Uh, Bob said, Nancy, did I hear you say the Markham paper is now online? I didn't say that. Uh, we don't know uh, that. I just said it'd be a good paper to check for that Mongolia area. Check with the Markham Museum and see if they have like oh, their Markham website Museum. and check to see if they've got it available. Off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, that is a little far outside of my 
scope. search scope, so I have never used anything from them, but it's possible that they have it. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and my final one here is not a question. It's a thank you very much for the talk. Oh, you're most welcome. Okay. So if you stop sharing, I will go back to my PowerPoint to finish things off. That's so easy. And informative. And the talk, the question and answer was great. Okay. Okay. Uh, upcoming meetings, we've got the DNA Special Interest Group on October 19th. Send me an email if you're not on my email list, and I can get you the link. Uh, the office and library, uh, our virtual library drop-in is the first Thursday, which is going to be October 27th at 11 a.m. We had a really great time um, in September. We only had two or three people join us. But man, we were able to do a lot of lookups for them. It was great. So the link is up on our website. Uh, it's on the blog and Facebook group and in the Ontario Ancestors events calendar. So everyone's welcome. Don't be shy. Come and see us. Our next meeting, uh, 1st of November, it's uh, Bomb Girls, Life at the DIL Plant in Ajax. Um, our speaker is Elaine Liebert, uh, who is librarian, um, community uh, outreach, and I think they're now also the historian. And just an all-around wonderful person. Oh, she's great, yes. And DIL, for those who don't know, stood for Defense Industry Limited, uh, who provided munitions for World War II. Came CIL after the war. Became CIL after the war. What was the C? Canadian, Canadian, Canadian Industries Limited. Limited. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our research room is second and third Friday, so that's October 14th and 21st. Uh, make an appointment with Stephen Wood. The one after that is our show and tell December get together. And I'm right now even starting to ask if you are planning on giving a presentation, uh, I need your photos so that I can put them in a PowerPoint. Let me tell you, it's really hard to hold up something, something to your camera in such a way that somebody can actually read it and see it. So you need to send me the photos ahead of time. And hopefully, We'll still be able to do in person and have the potluck Christmas goodies. That would be awesome after these last three years. So again, don't forget our November meeting is Bomb Girls, the 40th anniversary AGM, and cake. So you want to come. If the handout didn't show in your chat box, send me an email to me, Durham Chair at OGS.on.ca. I know those of you on pads usually can't download the handouts. There's our contact information. How's our time doing? We're okay? 8.35. Okay. So we actually have time for chat. If Kim will open uh, people's mics, uh, we can even talk to each other. Has anybody? Uh, Ted Barris has a new book out. Okay, Ted Barris has a new book out. I did see that. Dan put that in the in the Facebook I did. group. And that sounded interesting. Might try to grab him for next year. Uh, if you uh, if you don't want to speak in your microphone, you can text into the chat for me. Oh, um, Mr. Johnson mentioned that Cindy's List has some listings of Canadian newspapers. Okay. How about a topic? And let me go out and find a speaker for it, the way I had to do for newspapers. <laughs> and I found a great speaker. Jennifer, have you done that talk before? No, I just created it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. I, I have a, a question for Jennifer. Do you have any more microfilm in your um, collection that 
hasn't been digitized that you know the, the microfilms could get too old? Um, well, ours are all relatively new because I had to repurchase them all after the fire in 2003. So in terms of they're actually in phenomenally good shape. Um, but no, I do have, like I, I have the census reels, but they're all available online now. I mean, I have, um, I'm not. Uh, and the, the other microfilm that I do have, the public library also maintains a copy. So... But again, as I mentioned, I'm, we are no longer microfilming. Um, any digitization we do is skipping that step and going straight to a digital uh, format of some form, at which point we then have to migrate to whatever newest format is. But I'm sure that there are archives around who have microfilms that there aren't very many copies of that are gradually degrading and digitized but your your archive is not in that yeah we're okay <laughs> but we like i said we were able to to get a really great deal with uh dana data repro company um they did the the digitizing for free as long as we hosted it through their site so it was again <laughs> right along our budget so sites like that um smaller sites who are maybe struggling that might be the way to go rather than our digital world, just because it, it was it's too far outside of our budget. Okay, uh -oh. I saw Janice Carter put her hand up. Uh, um, I just wanted to say that uh, for people interested in Ted, Be Ted Barris's new book, the Lake Skugog Historical Society is having him speak on Tuesday, October 11th at 7.30 at the Port Perry Presbyterian Church. October 11th? Yeah. And it's uh, Port Perry Presbyterian Church? Yes. That's good to know. Thank what, you. What is it? That's Ted Barris. Oh. Ted Barris talking on his latest book, I'm assuming. And he'll bring the book to sell. He also spoke at Wikibook. Oh, he already spoke at Wikibook. I saw it. It's very soon. If it hasn't occurred, it's coming. Oh, okay. So maybe too late to get in. He's all, he's all talk to everyone around here. <laughs> <laughs> There's that to it too. I want the book of the North Atlantic uh, New War. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Uh, did anybody else want to ask a question? Type a question. Put up their hand. How long does microfilm last? That's actually a really good question. And I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, it lasts decades. It is, it's a very stable format. And ideally if it's kept within good conditions, so, you know, not huge temperature changes, not um, humidities controlled, it is designed to last, which is why we went with it. You know, back in the day, it was one of the best methods and still is a very good method. It just takes up a lot of space. Yeah. And you need a microfilm reader and all of that. So while we still have that, we, uh, yeah. we're we shifting away. Yeah, I remember Preston's had this vault in the basement. Yeah. And uh, it did take quite a bit of space because, because they were doing a star. A lot of, a lot of film was there. Mm -hmm. And I went to a workshop about data storage types. And they said uh, it was kept up. Uh, Control conditions 100 years. Yeah, no, yeah, like I said, it's a very stable. <laughs> yeah. If they're used and used hard, yeah, they won't be, they won't last. But no, it's a very stable medium, which is one of the reasons it was used for so long. But they're also talking about the fact that, that um, digital media don't last that long and you can't rely on digital media. You have to rely on there just being many copies because, because uh, digital media wears out much sooner than 100 years. Yeah, and I mean, you've got to make sure that you uh, migrate it to whatever the new system is. Um, so yeah, there's certainly pros and cons to both of them. Uh, you can lose information when you start making multiple copies, which is why you should always have a master digital copy, which is a high resolution, raw TIFF format. And then everything else that you work with is a second copy that you leave the original alone, and migrate it to whatever new system you have, and then it remains as is, and then any copies you make come from a separate file. So then you're getting talking about storage, server storage, and yeah. yeah. 
Well, and the drawback for uh, microfilm is you can't, or you, if you if you can still purchase it, it's extremely expensive now. Oh yeah, oh yeah. When we had to buy, that's why we actually cut half of what we had when we had to purchase everything after the fire again. I used to have up to the 1980s, and that was not happening. So now we have up to on microfilm. I want to say 1950, maybe 1960 in the archive. And after that, we just couldn't afford to repurchase it. Going back to Ted Ferris, mm -hmm. he, uh, Grant is saying he's talking at the Uxbridge Secondary School on October 27th. <laughs> I think he's doing the rounds. I think so. Yeah. Uxbridge is where it is. Oh, he lives there. Yes, definitely. In fact, I think it's Uxbridge Secondary School students that he takes on those trips over oh, to Vimy. Yes. And uh, or Tonga, that sort of thing. So Jennifer, I, I presume that you are still collecting um, old copies of uh, Oshawa papers. If they, if people find them in their attic, or yeah, if if they are ones that we don't have, and they're papers that are in that gap. Oh yeah, I take them. Like I said, and I will take them, no matter the condition. Is there a spot where you can look to find out what where the gaps are? Like? Is it written on your website or somewhere that you can tell so people could look up and without calling you to see? <laughs> you know what? That's actually a phenomenally good idea because, no, at the moment they just call me and I'm like, do you have this one? I'm like, I will check and be like, no, I don't. So, no, I that's actually a good idea. Good use of our website, right? Put that up there. But, yeah, no, definitely if somebody wants to bring in a paper and I don't have it, I will take it. You see them sometimes come up on the Washington community site and people have been renovating they come across it oh yeah they don't know what to do with it. i've had some under that were under floorboards that have tar on them and i'm like oh i'll take it i'll take it but it's it's I challenging just, I just hope they all get to you that's the thing because i've got a lot of people kind of in the community who know and are on the lookout for them so yeah. yeah how do you define newspaper in terms of what you pack i, I have a couple copies of the Mighty Midget, which was um, produced in Oshawa, it was more like a, an advertiser. Um, that's actually a really good question. I will collect, like I have weird odds and ends ones uh, that I will collect uh, because they, they are of Oshawa and they tell interesting stories and, and show an interesting period of time. So no, I will certainly collect. Yeah. I've, got, I've got digital of that. Um, it would put, it was my step-grandfather that ran it on Apple Street, where Tim Hortons used to be. <laughs> um, and it wasn't around for a long time. I think I've got two copies or one or two copies. Oh, yeah, there's this one called the Oshawa Journal that was, you know, here and gone. And I, I collect those and they're just... I didn't okay. hear mention of Whitney Free Press. Yeah, I assume they do. I haven't, I was, I was looking at the early, early ones, so. Right, mm -hmm. was a young guy. Yeah, Brian Winter was the Whitby archivist. Oh, I know Brian. Yeah, oh, yeah, he and I used to work together. Well, for our, our audience who don't know Brian. Yeah, Brian Winter is phenomenal. He still to this day, um, he goes through the Toronto Star archive and will copy articles related to Oshawa and just send me the transcripts. Good. Fabulous. Uh, fabulous. The Arno Weekly is still being published every week on Wednesday. I think it's Wednesday. I can buy them at McGregor's Drug Store. It's a very old history. <laughs> yeah. Nancy? Yes, Kim? It, it's Janice. We can hear Jennifer, but we can't hear your conversations in the room. Oh, okay. I can't. I can't. Anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, hard to backtrack now. <laughs> or repeat some of it. Uh, there was some discussion about uh, um, what was the name of your company you use for the microfilm? Oh, Preston Microfilm. Yeah, Preston Microfilm uh, was the uh, company that Dan and Ann took uh, some of the Bowmanville Statesman's papers from the museum and Ann, Ann had to iron them to get them flat. <laughs> so they had prep work to do when we actually um, got the microfilms made and uh, we have the copies upstairs in our library as well. Uh, for a certain time period, which we can't remember right now. And um, Bob was talking about a, a Oshawa midget, 
The Mighty Midget. The Mighty Midget newspaper in Oshawa. His step-grandfather ran it, so he's got a few issues that he's offered to Jennifer. And that's all I can remember. Yeah, that's about it. Short-term storage is short. Okay. Um, anyone else have any questions that uh, they wish to bring up? <clears throat> Maybe I can make a comment. I have been looking. Can you hear me? Yes. I've been searching on the Canadian Statesman and Orono paper for 30, 40 years and found a lot of things. One of the things I noticed about the papers oh, before the turn of the last century and around the time is that there were a lot of comments went into the, so the local columns that you couldn't possibly say, say, say today. <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> Yes. And I guess people, they weren't worried about being sued or anything like that. And that today, you wouldn't dare do that. But well, it, it, it makes I it for when, interest. Yeah, I remember when court decisions were published in the paper. Not anymore. And oh. your grade, when you graduated from school, your grade was uh, reported in the paper. Yes, your grades. Yes. No. So, um, I think at this time, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming. Thank you all for having me. And we hope to see you at next month's meeting.